So I, I want to introduce a couple of the panelists who are just joining us. We have Bob Elton, who is the corporate director and past CEO of BC Hydro. And um, Bob had a strong emphasis on culture and values and on leadership development. So welcome, Bob. Also, Emmanuel, um, oh, I, sorry, I just uh, <laughs> blanked on your Aruda, of course. Uh, and so Emmanuel is with um, League Assets. And um, what's been coming to mind, actually, we had dinner last night. And I know that, that one of the real distinguishing aspects of this, this investment firm that you've developed is a focus on multi-generational values and investments. And that for you personally, you actually went away, you recognized that you weren't pleased with the way business was being done, with the way real estate deals were happening, and you had a really internal set, sense of what was right and wrong, an internal sense of your own, your own values, and so you actually created a credo by which your company works from. And in a, in a relatively short period of time, you've built up an asset base of over a billion dollars. Um, and, and what you were saying is that you believe that it's really this sort of attractor pattern of people really connecting with how you're doing business around transpa transparency and, um, and some core things. Like I remember one, one thing I think you said last night was that it's uh, not about the net worth of an individual, it's about their own inherent worth. And, and that's something that, that's true for how you interact with every one of your clients. Yeah, wonderful. We also have Marilyn Taylor, who you all have met briefly. Um, Marilyn, I understand, is, is really not feeling well, and so I'm, I'm pleased that she's joined us. Marilyn is, um, as, as was mentioned earlier, a leader in really holding this vision of bringing us together. She's an advocate for these discussions for bringing awareness to leaders and, uh, and bringing a focus with values. And she's the director of the Institute of Values-Based Leadership at Royal Roads University. Um, and so she's a mentor of mine and, um, and such an advocate and such a gracious, gracious person. So welcome. And um, so to start out, actually, I have a question. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question um, for Bob. Um, you know, just I don't know how many of you can even show a, a share of hands. Read the Harvard Business School article that was on creating shared value last year that came out. A couple of people in the room. Um, so what it was was it was it's focused on how can we move beyond corporate social responsibility. That this idea that. Corporate responsibility and corporate competitiveness is mutually tied to the success of a community. And so they, it's not just how the impact of what a company does. So looking at you know, what are the outputs of your particular company, what resources the company taking in, and what's the impact on society, but actually taking it a step further, looking at your stakeholders, looking at the, how your suppliers and your distributors are making impacts. And, um, and Bob and I got into a conversation earlier about this idea of trust. I guess he, he recently returned from the World Economic Forum. He was heading um, a committee on renewable energy. Is that right? Yeah. And um, the conversation of trust came up. And so how can you trust your distributors, your suppliers, and how can you start to create a level of accountability that goes beyond your own company? OK, thank you. So, so it's a great question, or several questions that you just asked. And of course, I'm probably not going to quite answer them, but that's OK. Because, <laughs> well, because what I'd like to do is relate what you just said to the, the two speeches we've just heard. Um, when I heard, I mean, they're both inspiring in, in, in different ways. But the first thing you said, Tor, was you said you drew a contrast between the kind of experience that, that James was talking about and the kind of experience you would talk about. And I think that's actually, that contrast is at the root of the problem. In other words, if we think that the only intense experiences, worthwhile experiences we can have, are in situations like the one you described, James, where life's at stake. And if we think that business is, is just a place where people make money and produce stuff and all the rest of it, that's at the root of the problem. And in fact, Tor, what you then went on to describe was actually very different. In other words, you, you actually did describe, I thought, uh, an approach to values that was the same as the approach that you described. So when we talk about shared value, what, you know, what is a comp how should a company be thinking about its responsibilities? A company is made up of individual people and those people should come to work prepared to be the best they can, and they should behave that way. And if anybody finds themselves coming to work and being less than the best they can because they don't believe in the product or because they don't believe in the way the company does business, they should either change that company or they should leave. Because that, I think, is at the root of our problem, that we have this 
ridiculous separation between who we are as people, who we are in the family, who we are in our community, and who we are in business, and we can't have that. Wonderful, yeah. Does anyone have any comments, Tor? Did you have any thoughts or comments about that? No, I just agreed. You agreed, <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> So, um, so Tor, I actually have a question for you. So in the, the old model of business thinking and thinking about business systems was very sort of Newtonian or Cartesian, the idea that if you focused on the inputs and the outputs and the efficiencies, that it could be a well-oiled machine. Um, but there are some new leaders who are recognizing that businesses are actually living, living systems. And what's the impact uh, of actually being a living system, focusing on it as a living system while still trying to get the core business done? What is the impact of the living system? I, I really, you have to help me be more a little clear. Sure, yeah. sure. So how do, you, how do you balance the idea that people have emotions, people have dreams, people have their own ways of doing things um, with the fact that you have to get business done and focus on the core business? Um, it's more of a how you view people as subjects, not as objects. I don't know if that makes sense, but that you see somebody, we're not machines, we're human beings. We have uh, emotions, we have things that we value, we have dreams. And when you start to recognize that and uh, understand the dynamics that are inside of us as human beings, the potential that we have, and are, are focusing on how you can free that potential, that's when things are happening. I don't know if that makes sense, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. I'm, I'm also curious, Bob, what your thoughts are. I noticed that you had, I, I just noticed that you had a, a book on your resource list about living, about systems or about looking at living systems. Yeah, I mean, again, you're, you're good at asking complex questions. Yeah. No, <laughs> so, so, which require a bit more thought than I think we're probably, probably able to give them. So I, I, again, Companies, we're talking about organizations, and it applies to any kind of, com any kind of organization. Companies are not for profits or whatever, are made up of people, and I think we've all agreed with that. More fundamentally, what they do uh, must relate in some way to, to the community. I, again, I'm going, to go a, I'm going to go beyond your question and say something different. One of the things we haven't talked about is, is how imperfect we all are. So in other words, we've talked about who we are at our best, and we've heard some really ennobling stories about how people can behave in, in those situations. At the same time, all of us are not always at our best. And so all of us, you know, me personally, for example, one of the things that I really struggle with, I can get discouraged very quickly. I have to basically every day figure out how not to get discouraged and, and start every morning full of courage and then fight for it during the day. We've all got different weaknesses, right? And so in terms of this values discussion, one of the, I think, again, one of the complex questions is, how do we actually help each other through that? How do we admit our own weaknesses? Because as you've, as you've found out in spades, James, uh, people can behave, probably ordinary people, I would imagine, can behave terribly. And all of us can behave below the best we can. Yeah, that goes back to what Tor was saying about it. It's really that internal personal ownership as a leader to, to go to that depth. Tor, do you have anything more that you'd like to say about um, working with leaders and working with the executive team at, at Volvo and what it was like to get them to, to open up, imagining that there were shifts over that ele those 11 years? It is, I mean, 11 years is a long period, even if it's a short period as well. But the, the, the thing that I have been focusing on is, as I said, is not to implement something, to, 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 uh, to get something installed, is to free something. Uh, and free that potential, which we have inside of us, uh, all of us. So it's more listening to what is actually out there, what are the energies at stake that are, that are at play in an organization, and realizing those, facing those. And that's part of what you're saying as well, that you have fears. We all have fears. It's a survival mechanism for us to defend ourselves for the reality that we live in. But we face that fears then that's when we can start to deal with them and we can start to change things. So it starts with that. And I, I like that, that uh, story that you said that you, we need to acknowledge I have this deficiency or fear or fault or whatever. It's all how we look upon it. Uh, to me, it's a strength to say that. And I acknowledge these leaders who are standing up and saying, I have this deficiency or this, this fault or this behavior that is not very productive, very good. 
the minute that you do that, it changes the whole dynamics in that situation. So it's more to create the space for that to happen. And that is the job that we need to focus on. And that's not only a culture manager's job, that's every manager's or every employee's job to, to create that environment where you can share that. Because then you untap the, the potential. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, just to share my experience as well. Um, I don't think your mic is on. Is it? Yeah, Hello? Is it? Oh, yeah. how's that? A little better? Okay. Uh, in my business, uh, I have my, my business partner, Adam Gant, and myself. And we are two very, very different people. From the way we look, he's six foot eight, and so it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito, the two of us. And even our focuses, where Adam is always constantly looking and pushing for growth, uh, and that's just his uh, predisposition. Mine is to uh, look for ways to remove the hindrances to growth. And then the way I look at it, growth just happens more automatically. And there's many ways to do that. So the, the, the machine of the business itself but I also think of people sort of as wet machines. You know, if you watch Star Trek, we're bags of mostly water. Uh, and depending on the, how much sunlight we got or sleep we got, did we eat enough, are we in the middle of a divorce or whatever, we're gonna behave completely differently than when we're at our best. So that's stuff that's kind of hard for the leader of an organization to, uh, to do anything about on that kind of individual level especially when it comes to something, some sort of a personal crisis that can take a long time. But there is a lot of things that we can do to remove the hindrances to that individual uh, that they might not think to do themselves, like leading them in conversations to find out, for instance, just very simply, the person who's in the career track in the job that they want next. Well, what was the career track of that person before and where are they going next? Uh, the people around them. What are the, the challenges that they're facing and what are the needs that they have or the interests that they have? What can, we, what can you as an individual do to find out how to alleviate some of their breakdowns in their system or whatever? So that, for instance, you're not slamming them with a big pile of paperwork on their desk on Friday afternoon and they happen to have a predisposition to want to have their desk clear and then will drive themselves to work all weekend to get rid of it. Um, uh, we have employees, uh, we, we have a you know, security camera installed and uh, at one point, it would, it would flash me at night on my, on my uh, iPhone the photos of if something was going on in the evening. And I noticed that a couple of the people in our finance department were leaving like 7.30, 8.30 at night every night. And this one hella, uh, fella has four kids. Uh, you know, I don't have any kids. I want to have kids. I, he, he's living the life I want to have, but he's not even having it. <laughs> so, you know, I made sure that he now goes home on time, right, and, and spends time with children. You know, these are the things that I can do, but I'm very well aware that, you know, I'm not, you know, I had to turn that thing off, right? I can't, there's just so much email coming. Uh, but there's only so much I can do. So we're, we're training our organization now to have um, uh, personal coaching will be part of the benefits for every one of our staff. And that's to help people, and this will be completely private, separate from the company. Uh, so it'll be, you know, business coaching, per, uh, career coaching, or personal coaching, because at the end of it, you're not going to get ahead in business or career if your own stuff is in the way. And it really comes down to your own happiness. Uh, and so by providing those kinds of conversations and the self-awareness, the reflection back, that person comes to work happier. And I just finished watching something of a TED Talk uh, about happiness. And happy people are 37% more effective. Great! It makes money too, you know? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I, I gave myself my worst nightmare. I have a def desk job now, and I wouldn't w wish that upon my own employees, but they have to sit at a desk so far, but I'm learning from Tor that we might be able to send them home. Uh, and it, it, as, as uh, not fire them though, no, no, send them to work from home. Uh, but the first tenet of our credo is we'll do for others as we would have them do for us. Um, and you know, so that's what makes me aware. I'm like, I know I wouldn't want to do that, so what can I do to help you? And we're trying to pass that through the value the values and the, the culture of our company. Wonderful, yeah, and it's about moving beyond that self-interest to what's good for the common good, whether you're talking about people within your own family or within your company or within the, the nation or the world, and um, it's just different scales of that. So there was one question that came up quite a bit in, in these cards and in, in the questions, and it has to do with the Enbridge pipeline. And, and so I'm going to open it up to the panel and read the question and let um, those of you who have, um, have an answer for this jump in. Opposition to the proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline has intensified, culminating at a public rally last week in, in Prince Rupert, attended by First Nations, environmentalists, local leaders, residents, and even widely known music artist Biff Naked. I don't know who that is, but it sounds <laughs> um, intriguing. 
Uh, recently, a spokesperson for Enbridge has stated that the organization will not comment on the opposition rallies that are occurring. In your opinion, how should Enbridge align or shift its values in order to engender the trust of the concerned stakeholders? It's a big question. Marilyn. No, go ahead, Paul. No, no, please. I think that you have to back up the truck uh, because it's how these things come up that's the problem. You know, uh, we've talked about trying to, I think one of the th huge themes at this forum is how do we n notice our interdependencies across sectors, government, civil society, and business. Uh, when we get this far down the road, uh, somehow something has happened with business and some part of government that has taken something without building an understanding, without building, without, without uh, taking action that can be directed uh, from values that all parties who are affected by something like this has. So it's really the Enbridge problem I see as the fact that we don't have an approach to leadership in this country and probably most others that that includes all the sectors and all the affected parties from the beginning like it might look very different if that had happened so i think that's and then after that you're doing a patchwork job so how would what how might we move forward in a situation like this or what um what steps could be taken to bring greater alignment i bet please Bob. All right, so, so first of all, energy is a tough one because energy is something that is quite complex. I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I only was in it the last 10 years. I, I didn't know it all my life, but it is very complex. Most people in society will not spend enough time on it to really understand it. And therefore, people will have to trust people. They'll have to believe people if they're going to accept decisions being made. And that is, I think, the challenge here is that there's a lack of trust on all sides. So. Number one is there is actually a need for more energy literacy. And this is probably true of other issues, but with energy, think about it. You don't, you don't care about actually where it comes from or anything except you know, being able to consume it in a good way most of the time or how much it costs most of the time. And the energy system is complex. All right, so number one then is there should be more discussion. I think Marilyn just alluded to it. Leaders have a responsibility. Leaders of companies, leaders of, of nations, uh, you know, opinion leaders, to talk about energy in a reasonable way. You know, do we need more energy? Is this the right form of energy? Uh, is this the right project? And instead, we get to the third question, is this the right project, and start talking about that. And it's too late to talk about that because we haven't even discussed why we have an energy policy, or should we have an energy policy that involves exporting uh, you know, oil to different places? So that's number, number one. Number two, I, I think the question was phrased not yours, but the question was phrased a bit unfairly, should Enbridge adjust its values? I'd ask first, what are Enbridge's values and what are the values of the people opposing it? And I think that's where the, the, the discussion has, has been not very good. Uh, because on the one hand, there are people saying, including actually uh, government ministers, saying things like, we need this project because it supplies jobs. So what are the values inherent in that statement? One value is that we need a, more, a better economy for people today. Is there another value in that statement about how much we value today's jobs versus the future people's jobs? In other words, what is the value we place on the environment? I would feel happier if government people would say, we're in favor of this, but we recognize there's a balance to be struck between jobs today and the environment tomorrow, and this is what it is. And we recognize that there are issues with safety around movement of oil, and these are what the issues are, and this is how we've dealt with them. I would also feel happier if people on the other side would do the same thing. In other words, because we do have shared values around some things. We have shared values around the need to uh, you know, have some kind of economy that works. And if we have that kind, but we also have values around the environment, we have to have a real discussion. Do we want to develop the oil sands? And if we do want to develop the oil sands, over what period of time, with what safeguards, and how will we get the product to market? So. Absolutely. Those are great points. I also just wanted to make mention that we are going to go until 11.15 with this panel since we got started a little bit late. And so we'll go for another 15 minutes. James, I think I saw that you had a comment. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I think part of the process that, that uh, Bob is talking about um, is a process that um, is driven by 
a value that recognizes the legitimacy of uh, a particular political process. And it's, I think, what, what um, uh, other panelists have, have alluded to is that in saying, Maryland, for example, that we need to back up the truck, we need to back up the truck so that the process of consultation, the process of engagement, is not itself delegitimized. And so when you have a prime minister, frankly, who calls citizens who are going to a public inquiry to express their views, uh, and they're called radicals for engaging their civic responsibility, this is fundamentally divisive. Yep. And this is fundamentally inflammatory. Uh, I just had a, a, a really brilliant conversation with a gentleman from Victoria, um, uh, who uh, uh, Stephen Whip, uh, who told me about a process that he has been involved in uh, in Victoria through the um, Board of Trade and through uh, the various uh, business communities across the, the Gulf Islands. And it's a process that's called appreciative inquiry, a process that, that uh, engages the broad community uh, in um, a, a definition uh, of core values that drive business. And I think um, you know, that is another form of a legitimate uh, a process, a legitimate uh, process for, for defining the values of Enbridge, the values of the community, and so on and so on. And we also, though, have a formal political system uh, that we must protect. And when um, uh, members of that system, elected members of that system, and not just Prime Minister Harper, but others, engage in the kind of vituperative um, uh, attacks on citizens, this is fundamentally wrong. Uh, and this really only inflames uh, the, the situation and inflames uh, the, the, the volatility of, of, an, of, of, of a question uh, that, that is fundamentally a value-based question. What is the nature of our economy? What is, I don't say the, the, the balance between economy and the environment, but the right relationship. Yeah, right. Our economy is part of the environment. Our environment is part of the economy. Where are, where, how do we want to grow our presence as human beings, as a community, uh, here uh, on this planet? What is the, our relationship to our future? Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that that means absolutely no oil uh, uh, production or extraction. There are short-term uh, issues around getting us to a sustainable energy uh, future, not just within Canada, but globally. Uh, there's no question that there is a massive transition period uh, to, for example, sustainable uh, energy methodologies, uh, wind, solar, uh, hydrogen, uh, and, and other forms of, of energy. But the, 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 the issue really is how do we make those operational choices from a value-based perspective? And um, uh, that, I think, is really, really the key thing. And uh, it's not that, that in the process of exploring that there isn't conflict. Of course there's conflict. This is the nature of human interaction. But it's how do you structure that? How do you structure the, the process of engaging the inquiry? And whether it's an appreciative inquiry process or whether it's a formal political process, we must value the process uh, intrinsically. And I think this is, you know, from a corporate perspective, the kind of things that Tor was talking about, I thought w w was brilliant uh, in terms of a complementarity to some of the broader issues that, that, that I raised. Yeah, and I love that. I think one of the things that you said that really stood out for me is that it's not creating a utopian dream. It's working with our, our, our actual shared reality, the common reality and concrete reality. So, yes, Bob, please. I don't want to labor the Enbridge point, but I think it's actually a great, it was a great question and a great example. It's good to discuss concrete examples. And I'm actually, while I've been talking, I've been thinking about Site C, which of course is something that BC Hydro wants to build in, in, uh, in the Northeast, and we'll have some similar issues but I'd argue with a very different process, and therefore there will be more of that, and has been more of that discussion. So one of the difficulties I have with what we're all saying, so I, I totally agree with what you just said about the, the outrageous nature of some of the remarks that were made against opponents. Uh, one of the challenges I think that we have is that we are among the world's greatest consumers of fossil fuels per head of population. And it's another example of the specialization. We can have a discussion and get outraged by people developing oil resources, and yet, and yet, as a country, we consume them like crazy, energy generally. 
three times per capita what Europeans would consume. So values involves really being honest about what we are actually doing. And if one of our values is we really need to consume, not to enjoy the fruits of consumption, not to drive cars, but we really need to consume lots of energy and not care about it, well then we need to have that discussion too. Because I think that will be a rejoinder that maybe the, the, the Prime Minister might make. Recognizing our own ownership in it. Uh, so, Tor, I saw that, that you had um, something to comment on, and I also had a question here for you. Um, some, there were a couple here. One was about um, how does one start a dialogue in an organization that's afraid of dialogue? And there was another question around how do you move an organization really out of that place of fear when, when there is that level of entropy, as you called it? I, I don't know about this uh, particular situation that you talk about. Uh, right now, I mean the one, the, the big one uh, of energy discussion, but I think it's related to the questions that you have. How do you talk about the things that are something driven from your fear? Because it's driven from your fear of not being able to survive, not fear of not being uh, earning enough money, or whatever that is. I mean, it could be many different things. Different stakeholders have different stakes, and the fear of losing that stake that they have is ho hindering them, I think. So that's just the first step, I think, is to recognize that we do have different perspectives, and it's okay to have different perspectives. To me, the definition of dialogue is to agree that you don't have to agree. And that's a very good start, a very simple start to get the dialogue going. And we use the word dialogue, and we distinguish a dif big difference, and I'd say we, um, even at Barrow Valley Center, but also at YT, we did have a big difference between discussion and dialogue. Because I understand that language is very, very important. You need to invest time to understand some words that you are not used to, that you need to empower yourself with before you can have a good dialogue. And understanding the difference between dialogue and discussion is that dis discussion is dissection, breaking it down into pieces, stating what's right and wrong. More of a debate type. Uh, and there are situations when that is needed. But if you're going to have something where you co-create co and learn together, you need to have a dialogue where you are not having your pre preconceived ideas on how things are. Letting that go, which is a difficult thing, is a practical thing that you need to practice. When you do that, things start to emerge because you are starting to open up and see possibilities that you didn't see when you were in a discussion mode. So we, we're, we very clearly have, and we even have rooms. This may sound strange because that's a s social structure in this the physical structure in the, uh, in the company, we have rooms with a heading. You know, you have meeting rooms, right? Where you go in and take decision. But we also have rooms that says, in this room, we take no decision. Just to justify that this is a room for dialogue. Because we are not here to take a decision, we're here to listen and learn from each other. And there are those kind of simple things. Uh, I'm very much looking for the practical and very simple things because those are the ones that make the difference. If you have a too complicated solution, it doesn't work. I think, and it's usually quite basic. That's the immediate answer to that. Yeah, thank you. And I think David Bohm said that shared meaning is the concrete that holds a culture together. So it's through talking, it's through creating that shared language, language and shared understanding that we're able to, to move forward. Yeah. We have to remember, if you go into a room by yourself, you don't evolve. You can sit there and think, but you don't evolve. You evolve through the dialogue with others. And if we want to have a change, we need to acknowledge that and say, I need to interact with others. I need to diff get different perspective. And I usually think about that myself. One of the other things we need to make room for is room in our calendars and in our time. Mm -hmm. My partner just came back from Kuwait and uh, introduced a new concept, which was completely new to him. I mean, he runs his, his schedule by the minute. And what he learned is that you can't have less than a three-hour lunch there. Uh, and <laughs> what's interesting is that conversation really is a dialogue where so much is uncovered and, discu and discussed. Uh, you know, normally we're, 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 we're used to, at least at our company, packing things into 45 minutes or one hour increments, hour and a half max. But over three hours, and I finally, just yesterday, we had a, you know, a three hour lunch with our uh, VP of member services, uh, Adam and I, and so much was uncovered. Uh, the other thing in terms of what we're talking about in terms of, I love the, the, uh, the, the difference in the definition between discussion and dialogue, and I realize my own context had a lot to do with talking, but we have to also, uh, on top of that, but, but with, along with that, have to have the, um, the focus on our listening. So what are you listening for in a conversation as a leader? Every one of us has our um, winning strategy that we may not be 
uh, uh, conscious of, but we're always listening for that. And when that is not in a conversation, we tune out, we get angry, whatever, and we leave. But we have to go into every conversation fully present and listening. The other thing is with whose ears are you listening? You know, I, I, I have it that many times we come into a conversation with a context, for instance, that I am here as the Prime Minister of Canada or the leader of an energy company. And along with that title comes this context of he, these are the kinds of decisions I'm going to make or the kind of negotiation st stances I'm going to take. And when you have those ears on and you're listening for just your opening to speak and push, then nothing happens. Um, League Financial Partners, we have been really successful with uh, creating uh, land deals with uh, First Nations people. Uh, we're building, um, uh, we're actually going to, I don't know if I can announce this, but we are. Uh, the Tawasin, uh, on Tawasin here, we're going to be building a, a big mall uh, on their land. We did one with at Chilliwack at Eagle Landing and another. And it became from this open dialogue in the way that we have in working with business. Since the very, very beginning, I've always imagined League thinking of, of gears. Um, you ever see those fancy men's watches where you can see right through and see all the gold, golden gears and how they turn together? That's my, my vision of League. I want everyone to see how the golden gears fit together, turn together, so that there's no questions. One of the things that I was saying yesterday at dinner is the thing that drives me nuts is people often say, well, it sounds too good to be true. And that just, you know, everything is supposed to be this good. Everything else is supposed to be not good enough by comparison, but we've all been, had our standards eroded by mistreatment, mismanagement, under service, and, and whatever else. And honestly, I think that, that the, that mistrust or lack of trust is sand in the gears of the economy. Think about it. If I don't trust you enough to have the conversation, everything slows down and none of the other parts can move. If I don't, if I don't shake your hand right away, if, if my handshake, I'm not sure it means anything or your handshake means nothing, I'm not going to sign that piece of paper. And once a si piece of paper is signed, how do I know that you're actually going to move on it? And when? Are you going to start today or next week or next month? Is my, my work going to be on the top of the pile or bottom of the pile? Which comes back to my leadership and my organization and the ecosystem that I have around it. Are the values of the people that we choose to do business with reflecting the values of League? Because those people are lawyers, our accountants, or whatever, who are talking to other people on our behalf. We engage them. And the, pre the presupposition is that they're like us. And if they're not, they're just slowing things down. And we've got a big, big vision at League to change the world, and we don't have a lot of time. I mean, my business partner has a 40-year plan. I don't know anybody with a 40-year plan. Uh, so I did a lot of talking. Well, you guys back. No, it's, it's, it's wonderful, and I actually am wishing that we had more time. Um, we actually tour, and I know Bob had a comment, and we're actually past time now, um, which we will have time for you to ask questions and to network at the end of this. Um, but I, you know, I am hearing a theme from my conversation with Bob about trust, um, what you're saying about trust. I also think that there's a much larger conversation about what are values. I was at a conference at Wharton, and every speaker talked about values, every speaker talked about culture, but I think it's something that how we do it and how we work from the bottom up is, is something that each of us has a responsibility toward. May I just make a, yeah. a, I had an interesting um, experiment uh, that I played on myself along this cl class that I was taking this weekend, and everyone's got paper in front of them. If before you leave today, you will write down on one stage of paper all of your high-minded values, okay? Uh, world peace, uh, my family, whatever. All the highest-minded values you can think of until you're done. Then take the next stage of paper and write down what other people would see or would determine are your values based on where you're spending your time. Is it, for instance, doing New York Times crossword puzzles? <laughs> you know, because you spend so much time on that. Is it playing with your iPod or iPad? Is it surfing the internet? Where are you spending your time? And really, is it in line with your high-minded values? And for me, once I saw the disconnect, it wasn't like I was doing terrible things. I just wasn't working on my high mind and values. Mm -hmm. I, this, was, this was a really transformative weekend for me where I, I said, wow, there's a lot of stuff that I can just drop. I mean, these, these high-minded values are always there. They're the value underneath that drives everything I do. But now it's time for me to put my time and my, my energy into action. And when people think, say, by the way, that you don't have enough time, the formula for more time is energy plus focus. Wherever you focus your energy, that's where more time appears. And some of these other things will drop off that list. Great, thank you. How do you walk your talk and check your calendar and your checkbook? Did, did Tor or Bob, did either of you want to have any final comment before we wrap up? No.
<laughs> just, just a brief one, and I guess it gets to the question of how do you talk to an organization about values. And I was just thinking, if I, go, if I was to go home tonight and say to my wife, look, we need to talk about values, I can imagine it could be a tricky conversation <laughs> because she'd immediately wonder whether I was implying that she had a problem. Yeah. And so I think you do it very carefully. You may not even mention the word values. Right. It may be that you're just saying, look, we have a business need here. We have to build trust with, like, for example, if you're at Enbridge, I can imagine having that kind of discussion. Mm. Uh, so I think it's a question of looking at your company and figuring out what's really important to that company and how can you discuss it in the context of values and how can you do it in a way that doesn't imply that you think you're better than the people you're talking to. Because again, go back to what I said earlier, we all know that everyone in this room is just as human as everyone in, not in this room. And sometimes we can forget that. So that would be my, uh, and, and think about who the people are you're actually talking to. In BC Hydro, a 50 year old power line technician uh, or engineer, different conversation, I suspect, than the conversation that you might have or you might have, we're all different. Absolutely, great point. We're all trying to meet needs, yeah.